I'll start this thing off so that uh, we'll get it rolling. And uh, this is a Caribou History Museum event, the largest one we've ever had in our lives, obviously. And uh, we want to thank the, uh, the Sea Quarters Marina for allowing us the use of this facility, which uh, we, may have to, we may have to build an auditorium here, I think. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm Joan Maney. I'm the curator at the Caribou History Museum and the Crooked River Lighthouse Museum. And I have the pleasure of working with Tamara Allen, who is the most fabulous person I know in this town, who has started more things than, than I can even name here, from the Caribou uh, Historical Society and the Waterfront Community Partnership, and um, just many things that she's contributed to the community. And I'm, I'm real happy to be working with her. So um, <laughs> there she is. Thank you, Joan. That was that was nice. Uh, kind of embarrassing, but nice. Um, I, I have started a lot of things, and one of the most important ones that I've started was the um, Carabell Historical Society because there's just an amazing history of this town that the typical person. Um, passing through would just say, oh, there's a little fishing village that isn't anymore, and there's no traffic light, and there's all these things, but it is, in fact, an, an amazing historical place that had two fabulous boom times, but even, we go back, we go back to prehistoric Indians that lived here in some, some abundance from the time of, uh, 150 to 900 AD, and if you're interested in that far back, you ought to stop by the History Museum this afternoon and see our wonderful exhibits on those prehistoric Indians. Um, and coming up from there, we have lots of wonderful history, but the most important boom time that happened in Carabell was the one that went from the 18... 1880s up to the 1920s and there was all kinds of there were a lot of economic factors that went into that and if you think about where we are we are um, we're in the it was the only deep water port between Pensacola and Key West and it's right after the Civil War during the Civil War, there were about 50 people living here in a fishing village. And gradually, after the Civil War, by, by the year 1880, there were 200 people living here because of the enormous increase in job opportunities. And by 1920, there were 800 people living here. So there is a huge increase in the size of the town, the way the town was organized, and what was going on. And the most important thing economically that was happening were two things. One is that we have an abundance of wonderful longleaf pine trees here. And if you go to the museum and see the pictures, there are, um, you know, that's not me doing that, so it is me doing that. Is that, 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 that is me? Okay. Let's see if I can try to stop that because it's extremely obnoxious. Um, okay, that's better, right? Okay, so there were um, longleaf pines as big as redwoods. We have pictures of people standing next to uh, original old growth longleaf pines that are dwarfed by their size. They are huge. The cypress trees were hundreds of feet across. They were so big that they could, they could hardly get a whole tree on the back of a huge wagon, and it took 20 mules to pull that tree up onto the wagons and onto the train cars. So the original old growth, it's kind of God made a perfect place. Um, he put all these natural resources here, and then he made a natural deep water port. And um, I came across a newspaper article from 1880 that was put in the Pensacola Daily News 
all about the virtues of Carabelle, and they speak highly of our amazing um, deep water port that at normal tide was 18 feet to the bar, and apparently that was extraordinary for those times. And then by 1899, I have a letter from um, Oliver Hudson Kelly, who was the founder of the Grange Movement in America, and later the founder and mayor, first mayor and first incorporator of the city of Carabelle, uh, which ultimately was chartered by the state in 1893, but he first incorporated it in, in 1880. So we, he worked for 10 years before the city came as big as he anticipated, but he wrote great letters to the Corps of Engineers saying if you could dredge the bar here down to at least 20 feet, then we could even bring in more more ships to to pull the the natural resources and, and that are in barrels on the dock waiting to be taken away. Because those great pine trees were tapped. Men didn't take them very long to figure out if you cut a hole in the pine tree and let the sap run out that you could then distill that pine sap and turn it into what was generally called naval stores. But that was starting out with pine, the pine ros the rosin that came out of the pine tree, and they distill that into turpentine, pitch, and tar. And those items were critical to keeping boats afloat, for example, that you use those products to um, moisten the cotton and hemp rope that was between the boards that kept the ships afloat. And those were standing, those barrels of that product were standing thousands deep on the docks here ready to haul out. And they were having to send them on the train because they were they couldn't get enough boats here, and yet there were thousands, there were hundreds of boats coming here. And to the point that in the the report of the Department of Commerce of Florida to the governor in 18, from 1899 to 1900 said that Carabelle was the biggest international port in the entire state of Florida during that two-year period. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that just hard to imagine um, what that what that was like and that's just the rosin that then the other the other thing that was happening was the lumber there were seven lump seven sawmills up the various rivers that flow here into the Carabelle River and they were cutting down trees and and floating them down to the port to the two sawmills that are here or loading them on barges. They mostly would wrap them together and float them down the rivers or put them on the train if they had a small train that fed into the larger train. So the creation of the railroad here during this same time period and the natural deep water port made an amazing, um, that combined with the God-given deep water port and then the natural resources here that were just astounding. So it sort of sets the stage for how did how did we end up with such an amazing array of international ships out here on Dog Island after the hurricane of of, uh, of 1899? And um, I know that that's really what you all came to hear, but hopefully that gives you a little sense of what was going on here. Um, there were products, hundreds and thousands, literally millions of board feet being cut on a daily basis. And there was a projection in a correspondence that Oliver Hudson Kelly wrote to the Corps of Engineers, a very compelling figure, $2.2 million of products here in Carabelle ready to be shipped out on an annual basis. So. That was that was hard to imagine in the terms of what money was worth in in that time period. So anything we don't cover today, any of those things that are interesting to you, stop by the Carabelle History Museum next to Lulu's Cafe, where they have great coffee that I know everybody wishes 
we had here. And um, we're just... We're just glad that, uh, we're very glad that you are all here today and we're glad to have our main speaker and um, I was looking to see if Joan wants me to introduce Ivor and I think I will because I'm here and she's over there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, I will. So, Cal, if you could, apparent, uh, the heat is noisy, and now that there's so many of you here, it's so much more warm than it was at 8.30. Um, okay. We are extremely fortunate today to have, okay, I'm going to get this right, Ivor Molima. Molima. Ivor Molima. Okay, we tried to make him Spanish all for a year, but he's Dutch, and so, you know, we just keep pronouncing it the wrong way, and I am so sorry, but um, he is with the Department of State D Division, Division of Historical Resources, and he's a senior archaeologist with the Underwater Archaeology Department, and he has incredible credentials. You'll have to take my word for that because I'm not going to go over them today because I know we're just so anxious to get to, to the essence of our program. Um, but we are very lucky to have him here. And uh, with that, I would just like to thank you for coming. And uh, I'm going to just turn the microphone over to, to Ivor. Here we go. All right, guys. Well, this is definitely the biggest crowd I've ever spoken in front of before. Uh, I thought I was nervous for my thesis defense at the end of graduate school with 10 people, so this is uh, a little more daunting. First of all, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'd also like to thank the Carabal History Museum for hosting us and setting up this, uh, this great opportunity and talk. Uh, I'd also just like everybody to know that, I'm sorry, I'm trying to hold this as close to my mouth as I can. Uh, we are hosting a Facebook Live event right now as well for those that couldn't reach us through the phone that's in the center of the aisle there. So if you're moving up and down the center of the aisle, just be a little bit mindful of that so that they can still see and enjoy the PowerPoint as well. Uh, now, so first of all, you did an excellent job of introducing me. My name is Ivor Mulema. I work as an archaeologist for the underwater section at the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, which falls under the Division of Historical Resources. Uh, and I'll just let you know what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so first, I'm going to cover what is the... Can you guys all hear me through the speakers? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, what, first, we're, first, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what the Bureau of Archaeological Research is and does. Then we're going to be talking a little bit about the history of Dog Island. It's going to be much more general than what Tamara here... Tamara? Tamara? Yeah. Tamara, I'm sorry. Uh, just this, it, it's, the du it, it's the Dutch language barrier. Uh, <laughs> What, we're going to talk a brief general history of, of Dog Island. We're going to be talking about the archaeology of, long, of Dog Island, both on the island itself and a little bit offshore. Then I'm going to be talking to you about the shipwrecks on Dog Island, specifically the most recent ones that were exposed during Hurricane Michael. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about what's next and how you guys can be involved in that process as well. So first off, uh, the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, Research is charged with managing protecting, investigating, and documenting the state's archaeological resources on state lands. Now, on land, it's relatively easy to tell when you're on state property. We have signs up, fences, all that stuff. Uh, water is a little bit trickier. Uh, essentially, the state owns all freshwater sources, lakes, streams, anything up to the mean high water mark. Uh, as far as salt water goes, in the Atlantic, that stretches out three nautical miles. And at the Gulf, you can kind of see it on this map right here, and I'll have a more detailed map for you in a second. It stretches nine miles, or nine nautical miles, into the Gulf. Um, less, less than 1% of these 18,000 square miles of water has been surveyed for archaeological historical purposes. Worldwide, uh, the ocean has been surveyed uh, to only 0.5%. Uh, at a scale at which you can spot an airplane. 
You guys probably are all familiar with the big stories about trying to find an airplane in a big wide open ocean and them not finding them. That's exactly why. Uh, conversely, we have 100% of the surface of Mars is mapped, which is millions of miles away. <laughs> <laughs> so that should give you an idea about you know, what's out there, and you can kind of imagine what, it, what else might still be out there. And that, that's why events like Hurricane Michael, they, they, you know, while they do wreak destruction and stuff, they do open up some new historical resources for us underwater all the time. There's things that happen down in the Keys, and of course here, as we'll talk about in a little bit, shipwrecks get exposed by shifting sands in a storm here all the time, and a Hurricane Michael was strong enough to either wash two of them up or expose two of them that were buried underneath the sea bank, or underneath the sand, sorry. Um, and what we're, later on I'll be talking a little bit about those and the identity, or possible identity of at least one of those shipwrecks. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we actually do, uh, one of our current projects is the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail. There's some brochures on the shipwrecks in the back. Essentially what that is, it highlights some local panhandle shipwreck trails, anything from artificial reefs to historic wrecks that you can dive and snorkel on. Uh, there, you, know, you just have to get out there in some cases. One of them's in a river you can access fairly easily. Uh, but that's one of our, our key projects. I'm happy to talk more about that later uh, after the talk. Another one of ours is a site that we refer to as Minnesota Key Offshore. It's a prehistoric graveyard off of Sarasota that's about 7,000 years old that we're working on excavating right now. Uh, an upcoming project we have is a Fort Gadsden survey on the Apalachicola River. Uh, off of Fort Gadsden uh, at that park there, they're trying to build a Yeti and we're gonna do a survey in the river to see if there's any historic shipwrecks there associated with the, with the fort on land. We also have an ongoing canoe database. Florida has over 400 dugout canoes, which is more than all other states combined. It's a unique resource and we're continuing to excavate and, or excuse me, document those. And then of course, the reason we're all here is Dog Island shipwrecks. Uh, we've been familiar with Dog Island shipwrecks since 19, the early 1990s is when they first popped up in the archeological record. Uh, obviously, you guys probably know of, of a few more or a little bit more familiar with some other ones as well in the region. This one right here is one that we have very originally named Dog Island Shipwreck Number 3. Uh, it sits on the Gulf Shore of the island, and all that was exposed here, it's two frames. So you can see one here and then one in the background, and you can kind of make out a small tracing of them going towards the bow up front there. This one actually has a drift bolt going through the frame. Uh, but this is all that was exposed in February of 2013 when we went out there. And to give you an idea of the dynamic environment that's out there, uh, in just after Thanksgiving in 2017, this was totally exposed under, and six feet of sand was missing, and you could see a complete keel, uh, keel structure with a bow structure as well. So that's just to give you an idea of in a few months what can happen. That was exposed after a small, smaller storm just before Thanksgiving that only lasted about a day or so. So uh, Dog Island, as you guys are probably familiar with, is directly south of Carabelle. Um, to give you guys a little bit of ge geography, uh, we'll, I'll refer to this as the west end, and that is the east end. If you hear me talk about the St. George Sound, that's this body of water right here between Dog Island and St. George. Uh, if you hear me talk about Ballast Cove, that's this cove right here. This is Shipping Cove. Ballast Cove is so named because in the time of trade, as she mentioned earlier, uh, that's where ships could go and offload some ballast. So we have a number of documented ballast piles there. Shipping Cove is where three, now potentially four or five shipwrecks are located near. It is a true barrier island of sand and some sea scrubs and some occasional pine. Uh, it does have a shifting geography that this picture notates very well. So this, this picture is a georectified image of historical maps. They're overlaid to, to show the shifting position of Dog Island. It goes from 1900 to 2013. 1900 is in the dark gray, and you can kind of make out a few of the patches about right there. There's a gray patch, and there's a gray patch. But if you pay attention to the pink that overlays it all, you can tell that the island has gradually shifted north or towards the mainland and has stretched out from east to west. 
It's grown considerably on the west end here and has also eked out a little bit on the east end over here. Now the coves have remained relatively stable, but the strips of land separating the coves from the gulf have narrowed considerably. Now, this, what this means for archaeologists is that shifting sands means re-exposure or exposure of new shipwrecks or old shipwrecks all the time. Beyond preservation strategies, that also means that we're finding new stuff all the time. Hurricane Michael is an extreme example of this. The shipwreck I talked about a little bit before is a less extreme example, uh, but it's happening all the time and it could be happening underwater as well, not just on the island. This is very important for when we do remote sensing surveys. Some of that stuff only shows up on, only shows us what's on the seafloor, and some of it shows us what's on the bottom. So we've got to take all of these things into account when we do archaeology around the islands. Hurricanes are a big factor and a big impact on the island. Again, the most recent example is Hurricane Michael. Other, other ones like the 1899 hurricane that was mentioned earlier wrecked nine vessels on Dog Island alone and 20 vessels in the direct region. So brief history of Dog Island. Uh, I will start off with the prehistoric stuff just very briefly. There has been an arrowhead found on the island that indicates habitation up to 8,000 years ago in the archaic period. Uh, we have one dugout canoe that was found along with several lithic scatters that have been dated to more recently, uh, say about 1,500 to 2,000 years ago. Uh, after the discovery, or I should say exploration of Florida by Ponce de Leon in the early 1500s, Dog Island existed much more on the periphery of, of colonial empires. There was no direct settlement here in the region immediately, and there was no interaction in the waters here other than the occasional ship passing through. Now, it doesn't mean that, ship, that ships weren't aware of it or that captains hadn't documented it. It's just simply we don't have the record stating that they had done so. By the early 1700s, the French have set up a colony in, in New Orleans and in Alabama at Mobile Bay, and they're encroaching on Spanish lands in the Panhandle. Now, what that means is that all of a sudden, this region becomes very important and strategic for competing colonial powers. This also means that it's much more important to know what's out there. Before that, the Spanish claimed it, and they said that's ours, and they didn't really bat an eye after it. All of a sudden, they need to know exactly what's out there. The French, however, beat them to the punch, and we have this map showing a rough location of Dog Island right there at Ile aux Chiens, which roughly translates as Dog Island. That is the first mention, or the earliest mention, that we have found of the islands or island chain by that name. Now, it's still unclear whether this French Dog Island refers to St. Vincent Island, St. George Island, or actual Dog Island or all three, because it is plural, or if it's interchangeable with one of those other names. However, it is in roughly the right position for the cartography of the time, and it is mentioned repeatedly with this name or its translated version in another language right up until the present day. Now, there's a couple wrecks that I'm going to talk about very briefly that are of historic importance and have been very well documented. Uh, the first is in 1766. Le Tigre, it's a French merchantman carrying unknown cargo that wrecked here during a storm. The shifting sands here and the reef that's just off the east end of, the, of Dog Island creates a very dangerous area for ships, especially when they don't really know what's here. The ship struck a reef, Some of the, one of the owners died, and the captain survived and wrote uh, a very well-documented and still survives to this day shipwreck history or shipwreck story about his ordeal on the island. It is still unknown what it was carrying. There are some marks of manufactured goods, essentially some top cotton. Other people have speculated that it was carrying tobacco. Still others have wilder theories that it was something much more valuable. Um, but until we actually find it and can identify it, there's no way to say for certain. Now, the other one kind of combines with the second uh, event I have up here. The HMS Fox combines with the around 1800 activity of William Augustus Bowles. Uh, for those of you who don't know, William Augustus Bowles was a Britishman Ill illegally operating in Spanish Florida with the Cree, Cree in or Creek Indians, and he founded a nation called the Mus Muscogee Nation. Uh, it was allowed to sail privateers under its own flag and had a navy based off St. George Island. 
If that's where their Navy was, they undoubtedly were aware of Dog Island and the safe harbor it offered. Uh, a little bit earlier, in 1766, the British had documented this area when they were ceded to it by the Spanish, and they have marked the area north of Dog Island as a safe harbor for ships. This includes essentially all of Apalachicola Bay and the bay just south of Caramel. The barrier islands create a perfect uh, little shelter for ships where they can ride out the storm. They have direct access to fresh water with the rivers and springs in the area. And if you're running low on any food, you can also replenish at one of the settlements here if you're in that much trouble. Uh, I know this firsthand. We were out on the ship uh, at the shipwreck this, this past Wednesday when the gulf was tearing it up at about four to five feet. Inside the bay, you had maybe one to two feet. Much, much more manageable in our little boat, and I can only imagine that that gets exaggerated the bigger your ship is or the earlier you're sailing. Uh, after William Augustus Bowles activities cease, we enter the period that was talked about earlier. Uh, from 1800 to 1860, we have a great focus on trade, and this time it's mostly cotton coming down from Alabama, Georgia, and later other plantations in Florida. Sea cotton was highly prized by by buyers both domestic and abroad, and millions and millions of dollars of cotton flowed out of Carabelle, Apalachicola, and the general region. Uh, of course, in 1860 to 18, or 1861 to 1865, we entered the Civil War. Most of that trade disappears completely, although it was already in decline before the war. And from 1861 to 1865, we have direct evidence of blockading activities by Union forces, and also smuggling or blockade running activities by Confederates. There are several ships operated in the area. Apalachicola was taken and immediately abandoned by Union forces on the same day. That ended most Civil War activity in the area. We do have some documents of captured blockade runners being burned, other ships being burned, or industrial activity or industrial sites in and around the islands being destroyed or captured by Union forces. Now, from 1865 to about 1930, we enter that exact period that was discussed just before I started talking. We focus on lumber and fish. Lumber becomes naval stores, which goes into barrels, which is exactly what you see in all of these barrels lining Carabelle Dock here. Now, this is just the pier, so you can imagine what's in all the 22 warehouses that were also in Carabelle. Uh, wooden shipbuilding was still in it, was still being used quite heavily. Turpentine, pitch, oh, excuse me. Turpentine, pitch, and tar were essential. You'll see some pictures of that later. Pitch and tar were used in the caulking process of a, of a wooden ship where you could take some oakum, mash that down in between the planks as waterproofing, and mix it with the tar to ensure a good, solid seal. Ships needed a constant supply of this. Their wooden ships always leak and need constant attention. The pitch, tar, and from this area was highly prized and, and very cheap. And it, as you mentioned, it became one of the biggest international ports of the region, if not of the entire Gulf. Uh, fishing industry was much more localized. You see here in the background of this picture a couple of fishing schooners. Uh, now, it's only localized because of the extent of travel. They, the technology did not yet exist to keep fr fish fresh for much longer unless you salted it. But you could transport it for a couple of days and sell it on later. Uh, during this heyday, we have the 1899 hurricane, which is this picture. Uh, this shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a potential eighth vessel behind the Favette uh, wrecked on Dog Island alone. In this direct region, we have over 20 documented wrecks. Of these nine vessels that were wrecked on Dog Island, four were abandoned there, and the other five were floated. Uh, one of the ones that was abandoned was the Jaff Nahar, which is this one, the Vala, which is that one right there. Uh, those are both Norwegian barks. All of these ships were engaged in the lumber trade in the area. They're specially designed for that. Uh, if they did, they would have had like the American Burkentine that you see over here. In the bow, they would have had a special hatch that would have allowed access directly into the hull to store long staves of timber, long planks, long beams, and even raw timber. And then in World War II, from 1941 to 1945, there was a training camp on the island, and the Air Force, or the, excuse me, the Army Corps of the, of the Army at the time, 
used some of the waters around here as a practice range. The U.S. Army also performed rehearsals for amphibious landings like D-Day or operations in the Pacific in these areas because the beaches in here, if you've looked around, work perfectly for, for any kind of practice scenario that you could possibly want. So a brief overview of the archaeology of Dog Island. Uh, in 1995, there was a comprehensive terrestrial survey of the island. They discovered a couple of prehistoric sites and one shipwreck. They did extensive shovel testing, and they found one prehistoric site that's right on the shore. Uh, now, what that means is that it is eroding into the water, and there might be a submerged component to that, uh, which is something we'll have to look at once we get back to remote sensing in the area. In 1999 and 2002, FSU's program in underwater archaeology, or PUA, performed extensive re historical research and archaeological research on the island. That's the picture you see here of them documenting uh, one of the exposed shipwrecks of the time. I can tell you that that shipwreck is now completely underwater and no longer on the shore of the island. So in 20 years, the island has moved far enough, far enough north to completely submerge that shipwreck. You can't see it from the beach anymore. In 2012 and 2018, BAR, or the Bureau of Archaeological Research that I work for, was active on the island. We got another report that a, sh that a uh, storm had exposed a, sh a shipwreck on shore, uh, and they went in to investigate. The same thing happened in 2018, and that's what this picture is from. Now, this is a difference of maybe a few weeks from when the storm was, and you can already see that the shipwreck is totally buried with just some frames poking out of the sand there. And then, of course, we have Hurricane Michael that I'm all here to talk about, and we'll get, it, we'll get to all that in a second. This is Hurricane Michael as we saw it last Wednesday. It is directly in, or one of the Hurricane Michael wrecks as we saw it last Wednesday. It is directly in the surf zone. Uh, this is it at about halfway between low and high tide. Uh, and it is getting beat. Uh, you, behind here, it extends for a, a large area, maybe about 70 or 80 feet in total length. And then, uh, so. After all this archaeological surveys were completed, we have a brief synopsis of the maritime archaeology on Dog Island. We have Dog Island shipwrecks numbers 1, 2, and 3, which you see on the map here. This is area, the area where shipwreck number 2, traditionally identified as the Vala, or one of the Norwegian lumber ships, was. Dog Island shipwreck number 3, tentatively identified as the Jafnahar, one of the other Norwegian lumber ships from 1899 that wrecked here, is there. Uh, the circles to the east and to the south of that mark possible barrel wells by explorers or by shipwreck survivors, or they're just barrels that rotted out and look like barrel wells. We haven't de quite determined that yet. This is shipwreck number one, which is the one that you saw exposed earlier when I talked about the archaeological surveys on the island. It is now a considerable distance offshore, and while not inaccessible, we'll need some more intense operations to investigate that fully or assess the state of it. We're hoping it remains relatively buried by the sand and thus stays preserved for much longer. Uh, no. So I, I was looking at the um, measurements that we took off number three in February of last year and the measurements that we took off the shipwreck this time. Now, while they are similar, this one is of a, the Hurricane Michael has bigger dimensions, so it's not, or it's not from the same wreck as I see it now. Further investigation might yield that it's a similar ship because it looks very similar. It has some of the same characteristics, but we'll get to that at the, in a little bit. Uh, we have some shipwrecks offshore. There is at least one identified off each end of the island. And of course, we have historical documents telling us that there are many more shipwrecks in the area, everything from right on Dog Island, offshore in the Gulf, inshore in the Bay, from the Civil War to earlier, and from the Civil War onwards. There's even a couple of U-boat victims in the area that have yet to be found. Now, Hurricane Michael, as you all know, hit in October of last year. This is Dog Island in the area where the shipwrecks were found just before the hurricane came through. Note the position of this pier in relation to the line of the beach and the line of the beach in relation to this house in particular. This is Dog Island right after Hurricane Michael came through. This is on 14th of October of last year. 
Uh, now you can already see just in the north. Oh, everybody's okay? All right. <laughs> so you can already see that the beach has been scoured out on the northern or bay side of the island. This pier is still in a relatively good state, but has clearly functioned as some kind of a barrier for the currents to deposit more sand on this side and scour it out on the western side. This is the uh, bow structure that we'll see in a little bit that got exposed during her, her, exposed or washed up during the hurricane. And this, right in here at the edge of the picture, oh, at the edge of the picture is the hull section and the possible dock or house structure that we'll be, that we'll be seeing in a little bit. These pictures are great for us because they allow for immediate identification. NOAA published these within a few days of the hurricane and immediately people spotted the shipwrecks. Obviously, the people that lived on Dog Island noticed them first. We got great amount of public attention. Uh, you know, with recovery efforts in the area, we weren't really able to go out and visit them until last, until last Wednesday. However, before that, some of the local inhabitants here, and I'd like to in particular uh, mention Frank Stevenson and Rod Gashi, they helped me out a great deal. They were visiting the, the sites and they took some very good pictures that allow for us to create a good timeline of what these shipwrecks looked like when they were first washed up to what they look like now. This becomes important later on when I talk about what's next for the Dog Island shipwrecks. Can you show the previous slide for a minute? Yeah. I can also, um, I, I can provide the PowerPoint to the, to the History Museum and then they can distribute it from there forth. Yeah, so that's that's all shifting signs. That that the land has moved, the house is not. <laughs> the house was for All right. All right, the, the the record on that I had said 2018. It's it's moved further where, sorry? Toward the dock. Okay, well, so that explains that, but it's still evidence of how the how the dog island uh, sands have shifted during the hurricane to allow for the shipwrecks to become exposed. So thanks for letting me know that. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, as far as I know, it's impossible to tell. Uh, we have no documented cases of shipwrecks in that location. I can tell you that when we were here in February of 2018, this dock structure was visible. It did not have a hull section on it. Um, so that, I suspect, is washed up, or it became exposed somewhere along the edge of the beast and, wa and washed up there. This, I couldn't give you a definite answer. It, both are very, very possible, uh, given the history of the island and the shifting sands. So first, we have the hull and the potential dock or house structure. Uh, this is an aerial view. Right here at the bottom, you see the large hull structure and the dock and house structure right here. And then on the top side here, you have the bow structure or shipwreck as we've been referring to it. So if you hear me say shipwreck, that's, that's the one I'm talking about. If I say hull, this is the section I'm talking about. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not stepping on you. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was it? Let's see. It's okay. Does that work better for everybody? All right. No? All right. Right here? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I. I'm going to try and move around as much as I can so people can see. Uh, now, beyond the hull and the dock structure, we also have the bow structure. This is it, as it was exposed right after the hurricane. You can see some sheeting on the bottom of the, of the shipwreck right there, right there. You can see something poking out of the ship here. I suspect it's one of the iron knees that we saw there last Wednesday. And you can clearly see this this black stuff right here is the tar or pitch that was mentioned as part of the naval stores. Now they put a layer of that underneath the sheeting 
to ensure complete waterproofing of that area of the hull. It is the part of the ship that is in the water after all, but you can't really access it once the sheeting is on there, so you've got to put a thick coating down to ensure longevity of your investment. The sheeting would have gone all the way down the hull up to where the water line was and potentially a little bit above. This is actually a different thing, but we're going to be talking about that in just a second. Um, so, from the. Sorry? The, what, what we saw yes, uh, on Wednesday said it was, was like a copper or months material. Oh, I just to see it. Uh, okay, so that was completely buried when we were out there, so we didn't get a chance to see it. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> that works. Uh, so, um, I'm just going to ask you guys, based on these, sh these shipwrecks, what are some of the other questions that archaeologists would, want, would like to answer? Uh, now, the number one that we're all looking for is when did the ship sink? This is answered through a mixture of historical documents and archaeological analysis of the structure of the shipwreck. We want to know when it was built. This is just as important. It gives us more of a time frame for the sinking. We want to know what the ship's purpose was. In this case, we suspect they were large lumber ships in the area. Um, where did the ship come from? That's a little bit harder because we need to know a definite identity before we can figure out an, origi or an origin of the ship, uh, and we want to know why the ship was there. In this case, that's also kind of answered by the purpose of the ship. If it's a lumber ship, it's most likely in the area to pick up lumber stores from Apalachicola, Carabelle, or the surrounding region. Now, initial clues, and this is part of uh, the sheeting that we talked about earlier, uh, it's known as Munts metal. metal. It's a mixture of 60% copper and 40% zinc with some traces of iron. It wasn't patented or developed until 1832, so that gives us a good timeline from where to start. Anything earlier than that, ships wouldn't have had this. So that's our cutoff point as far as historical documentation of the shipwrecks go. It replaces copper sheeting because it's almost a third of the price and does the same exact thing. Now around here you can see some of that pitch and tar. You can see some small tacks that would have held the Munts metal in place. And you can also see a hole for a trunnel or a tree nail that would have been hammered through the hull into a frame to keep the planking in place. We also have several copper or months fasteners. Now this is the best picture we could get there because a lot of the uh, copper fasteners have been, or exposed copper fasteners have been cut off and recovered by, by looters. But you can kind of see the rounded head on top of the, uh, of the fastener there. That indicates that it's of a later date. Uh, advanced industrial procedures can then create standardized bolts with a rounded head that you can drive into the ship, as opposed to giving them a basically straight bar that you would hammer and see a direct flange on the fastener itself. We also have some charred timbers on the bow structure of the shipwreck that was exposed. You can see the black charring on the edge of the frames that indicate that this ship was likely burned to the waterline. As far as my records show, none of the 1899 hurricane shipwrecks were burned to the waterline. They were simply abandoned or salvaged as much as possible. So that gives us an indication of what kind of historical record we should be looking for. Uh, and another one, you can't quite see it because it's underneath all this sea foam, is there's concrete in the bow of the ship uh, that would have been used as ballast or potentially as a, structure, a small structural component in the bow where it's taking a lot of beating from the waves and as it travels. Uh, that wouldn't have been used in shipping until much later in the 19th century. So that again gives us a good starting point for a timeline for a historical search as well as for the archaeological record. So the bow structure, the, way we, the best way for us to identify this is to take measurements of diagnostic timbers. Diagnostic timbers in this case are the keelson, which sits right above the keel inside the hull and runs the entire length of the ship. The frames, which you can see sticking out here clearly, you have floor, floor timbers, which create the bottom of the hull and then climb up in futtocks or other frames to the top of the ship. 
We have outer hull planking and we have ceiling planking. Now, if you hear me mention ceiling planking, that's simply the planking that's on the inside of the ship. So that's what you see exposed right there and along the right side of this picture. This picture was taken in October of last year. Uh, the shipwreck has since moved and is sitting much more parallel to the shore now, and it continues to shift position as the waves and storms and general currents of the area keep working at it. Now, the keelson was 14 inches sided or along the top of the shipwreck, or along the top of it, Hull planking was an average of 3.9 inches thick. The frames were almost square at 10 and a half inches, or 10.4 on one side, and then 10.7 going the other direction on average. And the ceiling planking was an average of 4.6 inches thick. Now, the reason this becomes important is because in later years, and especially in the later half of the 19th century, which is when we're looking for this shipwreck, insurance companies, navies and countries all had laid out strict guidelines for the construction of the ship. If your ship was 300 tons, you needed a keelson that was this big and a keel that was that big and a hull plank that was this thick at this specific location. We have all those records and those dimensions that they require. That allows us to provide a rough idea of the size of the ship, which then also allows us for further identification. You guys, are, so this is the keelson. Some of you will have noted in some of the pictures that came out, there is a square or rectangular hole in the top of the keelson. We suspect this was a vertical deck, deck support. It's a little bit too underbuilt to be a mast step. If it was a mast step, it would have had more construction going either side of the, of the keelson. These are the frames and the ceiling planking I was talking about earlier. These are the second part of the frame that comes off of the floor timber at the bottom of the ship. Now that's important to bear in mind because as the frames get higher on the ship, they also get smaller. So we need to know the position to be able to accurately identify them in the historical shipping registers and then get a good identity off the ship. Now here you see a good example of the ceiling planking in the bow. Uh, some of it's rotted away, some of it's simply broken off, and some of it's unfortunately been cut off by, by visitors. Uh, you, these dark spots that you're seeing inside the hull uh, were initially identified as slag, but when we were out there, it's, it's charcoal, and we suspect that that's from the burning of the ship. Remains of the, of the fire uh, fell down into the hull, and with some of the iron fasteners and some of the iron knees that were there, concreted into a hard mass. Uh, it, not, it is not any form of ballast, it is simply the remains of a disaster at sea. Now, what that does mean, though, is that we do have iron knees. Only one of them was visible on site, and it's such a state that we couldn't get any accurate measurements off of it. Iron knees are like big L brackets. They sit along the inside hull of a ship and support the deck. They can go maybe a foot or two along the deck and then go all the way down to the keel if they need to. So they're quite big and quite large, but they replace large wooden timbers that would have been serving the same purpose on board. They're much lighter and allow the ship to carry more cargo, and probably most importantly for anybody owning the ship, they are much cheaper and easier to produce than waiting 20 years for an oak tree to grow in the right shape <laughs> so that you could have the piece of wood that you needed to. Iron knees, as well, provide an indication they didn't become commonplace on ships until after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. And even then, it's much more of a regional question. Uh, in areas like the northwest of the states, they would have been less, they would have potentially been less common because they had an abundance of, uh, of timber there that they could still use. And in areas like Scandinavia that are also rich in timbers, they continue to use wooden ships with a smattering of iron components like knees in there until a much later date than most other countries that had already switched over to iron hull or steel hulled ships. Now, based off of these measurements and uh, what is known as the Register of American and Foreign Shipping of 1895, yes, sir? That depends on the tonnage and size of the ship. Uh, all of that was defined. Oh, I'm sorry. So he, he asked uh, what the average length of these ships was. Now, 
The length of the ship, as with everything else on these ships in these later days, is cl very clearly outlined and defined. Uh, some of the Norwegian ships that we saw earlier uh, that wrecked in the 1899 hurricane were over 140 feet long and about 20 to 30 feet wide. Uh, just to give you guys an indication of size. This, however, was identified as a larger ship. Uh, it is 600 to 700 tons. Initially, I thought it might match the Hindu, which is a 1899 Norwegian lumber ship that was built in Germany. And you can see it in the picture here with a couple of the other wrecked ships in the background there. Now, uh, other than the masts and the sail, wrecked in 1899. Wrecked in 1899. Excuse me, he asked me if it was built or wrecked in 1899, uh, and it was definitely wrecked in 1899. It was constructed within a couple of decades before then. And it was constructed in Germany. Now, other than the sail hanging over the side and masts and spars being all helter-skelter after a hurricane, this ship is actually in very good shape. Even though I thought it matched it, and it's a likely candidate with that area and some of the other shipwrecks that have survived in the area, this ship was refloated and salvaged. So it can't be the one that's left behind. It also shows no history of burning, which eliminates it even more. Because uh, it would, it, do you have a question, sir? That's correct. This is the Hindu wrecked in 1899 after the hurricane on Dog Island. It, it however, did match the size of the ship, we think the ship, based on the measurements we took, is 600 or 700 tons, potentially up to 800 tons, depending on how much play they had with other components of the ship. This is a 632 ton vessel. Um, other candidates after this one was eliminated include the Fanny Holmes of April, that wrecked on April 8, 1860. It was carrying cotton. Yeah, sorry. It was carrying cotton, and it was a bark um, that weighed, or not weighed, excuse me, that was the size of 673 tons. Now, that falls right smack in the middle of our identified size of the ship and matches up very nicely. It is also the only ship of its size and of the right date that I could find that had direct documentation of it burning down to the water line. So that matches this, the time. It matches the technology that would have been on board and it matches the fire incident of the wrecking of the ship that was evident on the shipwreck remains itself. What does it mean it's a bark? A bark is just a, exactly. It's a, no, 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 you're okay. So a, a ship is essentially just a big boat, right? If you talk about a bark or a ship or a schooner or anything like that, beyond that, you're really talking about the rigging and the setup of the masts. So a bark has three masts and has its sails configured in a specific way. Exactly. It's just the hull would have been, you could have had a, a, the exact same hull, but you could have had it be a bark, a clipper, a schooner, any, anything else. It just refers to the mass configuration. Typically with maritime archaeology, we're unable to identify it that far because the masts and the spars don't usually survive. So we have no idea of telling how the ship was rigged and identifying it to that extent. We have to rely on diagnostics from the hull as we're doing here. Um, and beyond that, you can change the mast and sail configuration over time on a ship. Sailors have done this for centuries. So there's no saying that if you find the masts on the shipwreck and it looks like a bark, that it might not have been a schooner or another type of ship or boat at a different time in its history. Is that particular is that the this, no, this is, this is identified as a uh, Norwegian lumber vessel. It did not provide me with the uh, oh, so rigging. Not directly, because it's it has a three three mass configuration, but that's the basis of almost every single uh, sailing configuration after that. If it had more mass, I might be able to tell you a little bit more. <coughs> Potentially. So the other candidate that we have is the Kelly B that was wrecked in March of 1875. Uh, it. Uh, sank in a storm and it, and it weighed in at 738 tons, which also falls a little bit towards the higher end of our, of our range, but still falls very nicely within it. However, it does not have any documented evidence of burning. 
Um, so as far as these three candidates are concerned, as you as you've mentioned, the likeliest candidate is the Fannie Holmes of April 1860. Uh, this is not a definite identification. We don't have enough diagnostic measurements yet to completely confirm this. Would samples that we could possibly take in the future would aid in identification? And there's nothing to say that any of the vessels that were mentioned as wrecked of a similar size um, weren't also burned or had some fire damage on board. But based on the evidence we have right now, this is the likeliest candidate I was able to find. Yes, sir. No, I, uh, I just know that the Hindu was built in Scandinavia or Germany. I do not have any direct records of where the Fannie Holmes or Kelly B were constructed as yet. That, that's our next step. That, that is one of the, oh, sorry. The, uh, the gentleman asked if we, could, uh, if we knew where the ships were constructed. I do not know where the Fannie Holmes or Kelly B were constructed. And then he asked me if the DNA or the identification of the wood would aid in the identification of the shipwrecks or where they were constructed. Uh, that is very true. It is one of the tools that we use to identify ships. However, it does not usually provide a definite tool uh, unless it comes up as a Cypress ship and we know only of one Cypress ship in the area. Uh, but it can, if we age the wood, provide a rough range of dates that we could look in for historical documents. And if we know that it's one particular wood that was favored by a uh, or for a particular construction project, then we know that it might be associated with that, but it won't provide us with a definite identification of the ships themselves. Uh, for that, we usually have to rely on artifacts that we can directly associate with historical documents or a manifest of the cargo that was on board. Or if we're very, very lucky, we find a ship's bell that says Fanny Holmes on it. Uh, <laughs> And that pretty much settles it for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so are both the Fanny and the Kelly supposedly went down here to Tulsa? Yes, they went down in the vicinity of Dog Island with it. That's all it says in the historical records that I have on hand right now. Um, you know, it, we only were out there last Wednesday, so we're kind of in the beginning stages of narrowing down a firm identification of the shipwreck. As we get further, I'll be sure to share any information we have with the Carabelle History Museum and the Lighthouse Museum here to make sure that you guys keep up to date with that. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, uh, the gentleman asked, or mentioned that you could use the fasteners that were in the ship to identify the ship. Sometimes they have maker's marks on them, uh, the particular style, shape, size, material used for the fasteners all allow us to identify it, but it's kind of the same story as with the wood, unless we find a definite mark on the fastener that says, in, like you said, with, in New Hampshire there was a shipwreck uh, that Paul Revere had stamped his maker's mark on the, uh, on the on the copper fasteners. Without something as direct evidence like that, and especially in a more industrialized time period as we're looking at here, these would have been much more plain. You would have, you know, here's your crate of copper fasteners, go ahead and use it on the ship. Potentially the box would have had where it came from, maybe it didn't. Then the other case is, in this case, the fasteners are still deep, deep in the wood and we haven't been, you know, to pull them out is a whole operation in itself and we don't know what that would do to the ship. However, looking at them, measuring them, potentially collecting samples from them for metallurgical or wood analysis would again put us more, clo or more and closer in the ballpark of identifying these ships. Yes? That's totally fine. That's why you're here. <laughs> Okay, so that's exactly the response I was going to give. Um, the, the madam here asked if um, 
what the next step is with exposed shipwrecks like that. I'll be covering that in a little bit more detail towards the end of my presentation. But she basically mentioned uh, or questioned whether we would leave them in place, rebury them, or completely dig them up and recover them. Now, I'm going to be covering the various situations and scenarios that we can towards the end of the presentation. That will hopefully answer, uh, answer that question. Uh, now, so as I mentioned, the Fannie Holmes is the likeliest candidate that we have at this moment. It is not in any way definite, um, but it is a good starting point for us to move forward from there for more historical research or provide, uh, provides a guideline for further research on the wrecks themselves because we can look at specific aspects that might lend for a more definite identification of the ship itself. Now, from that bow structure or that shipwreck, we move on to the hull section. Uh, this on the right here is the hull section as it appeared in on Wednesday uh, when we were there. You can see, compared to this photo at the bottom left here that was taken just after the hurricane uh, in October or November of last year, it is no longer resting on that dock or house structure uh, that I mentioned earlier. It is completely free of that. That's actually in the surf right over there. Uh, so. As I mentioned before, Dog Island is a very dynamic environment. It does mean that these ships can be moved. Uh, water is much stronger than you think. It has shifted shipwrecks completely upright in the keys um, that were 200 feet long and made completely of iron. So it is entirely possible that some waves or the currents over time or scouring of the sand meant that this shipwreck has moved off. You can also see a little bit more damage right there um, and we'll cover that a little bit more later. There is a frame poking through the hull planking. Um, that is not evident in October or November. So that we suspect, looking at that damage, that that's really caused by nature enacting on the on the uh, on the hull section there. Uh, unfortunately, when we were there, the tide was coming in, and we only had a little bit of time. So we're only able to get measurements on the hull planking. That does provide a rough identification. Um, and I mean rough because we have hull planking on there that fits a vessel that is 800 to 2,000 tons in size. Um, now, our key issue here, uh, beyond not being able to get to the frames that are completely buried in the sand, we tried digging them out a little bit, but every time a wave would come, it would completely rebury them again. So that ended up being a lost cause until we can come back. Um, another issue we face with the hull planking here we, as yet, do not know which part of the ship this is from. Is it closer to the keel, where the hull planking and the frames would have been bigger or thicker, or is it further and higher up, where the planking or where the size of the frames and the planks start to vary a little bit? If we're able to narrow that down further, that would allow for a more definite identification. But as yet, we have hull planking that's 5.58 inches thick on average. What that means is that it fits on different parts of the ship, anything from an 800-ton vessel to a 2,000-ton wooden vessel. Uh, that means anything in size from 150 feet up to a potential size of maybe 250 feet. Uh, so again, even with that, it's a big range. Lots of ships in the area fit that. I can say with relative certainty that this is not likely to be of the same ship as the bow structure is. Uh, now that's a little bit surprising because they both washed up at the same time, so you might expect them to be from the same wreck. Um, however, this, the difference uh, in thickness in the hull planking denotes that they're not, but they are from the same time period. This one has some Munts metal on it, the material that we discussed earlier that's after 1832. It also has detailed copper fasteners with a head that indicates a more industrialized production. Um, so it is from that same time period, but if you look, and I think you, got, you had a list posted at the back of uh, Dog Island shipwrecks, you'll see after 1832, the list is still very long. Um, and it is all kinds of ships from everything from a small fishing schooner to a large sailing vessel, um, which is what this falls under. So it, with this shipwreck, unfortunately, I'm not able to give you a name of a ship or any candidates even. All right, so he asked me uh, what fasteners I'm talking about. So the fasteners I'm talking about are the ones that we saw a little bit earlier. Oh. That's the large one, okay. 
Yes, it, it, is the te it is the large one. We have some smaller ones. Yeah, so the, the copper cut nails that you saw, I suspect, are sheathing tacks. Uh, he mentioned that he saw some uh, what looked like smaller copper cut nails uh, on the beach or on the, on the ship itself uh, when he was out there. When did you say you were out there, sir? In, in October of last year. Uh, so if we look at this picture of the Munts Medal, I think what you saw are probably these. Uh, October 13th. So what you saw is probably something about that size. Those are no big... The shaft was square? Yeah. That's still very possible at this time period. I didn't see it around his head, and I didn't go in and get it. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking, wow, look at all these square copper cut nails. So what he, what he mentioned is that he saw a lot of square copper cut nails. Um, that is still very possible at this time period. Um, they're not all going to be rounded, and different nails provide different services on a ship. Uh, a ship made out of almost an entire forest of wood requires all kinds of different kinds of nails, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that that was there. If they were completely loose, it is also possible that they were ship stores or kept the spare. They were in the ricks? Okay, yeah, then I, I suspect that they served something like the sheathing purpose uh, if they were embedded. Uh, however, I'd need to take a good close look at them. These were all in the ins. Mm -hmm. Because when we saw the ship, we were pictures of it. Yes, sir. It was the inside, and some of that wood was torn away, and you could see this much of the square. I see. Okay. Uh, so he mentioned. Yes, ma'am. We, we do have Rod Gashie's picture of those square cut nails, mm -hmm. okay. and they're bent back. It's on that little monitor uh, over there by the ship up list. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, so we, I can take a look at that later, and I can and talk to you a little bit about that. He mentioned there's a lot of square cut nails inside the hull on that ceiling planking that we talked about earlier. And that's something that we're going to have to look at later for more uh, identification. So the hull section, unfortunately, doesn't have an, ident uh, an identity that I can ascribe to it right now. However, I, we were able to identify some very obvious threats to the shipwreck itself. First, we have looting. Uh, now, what you see in this picture is a freshly cut copper fastener that somebody sawed through. Uh, over here is another co a thicker copper fastener um, that was completely embedded in the wood and hadn't been extracted yet. So you can clearly see the difference in coloration between a fresh cut and a old cut or a damaged fastener. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, any, any, pr any uh, shipwrecks or archaeological resources that fall within state waters are directly property of the state. It is at the very least a misdemeanor and, prob and possibly up to a third degree felony to remove anything from a ship so, or from an archaeological site without direct permission. If you see anybody doing this while you're out there, please just tell them that it is state property, that they shouldn't be taking in anything. And if they continue to, either call the local police here or we have very good relations with the local FWC and they're much more familiar with the archaeological laws of the area. Uh, now, the second one is surf damage. Now, this is a picture of that damage that I was talking about on the hull. Uh, the hull has since moved, as I mentioned. It is likely that during that process, one of the frames became dislodged and decided to poke its way through the hull. Um, that, br that break that you see there is not a cut mark. We didn't see any saw marks or anything there, so we think it's just old wood that's, that's gotten damaged and decided it couldn't hold on anymore. Uh, we also face exposure damage. This is one of the inside ceiling planks on that bow structure that we saw. You can see it's all cracked and dry right now. Um, so that's what happens to wood if it dries out after it's been soaked and completely waterlogged. The water replaces some of the cell structure that's, that's in the wood, uh, and then eventually, uh, if you let it dry out completely, that cell structure completely disintegrates and the wood will just fall apart. Uh, this has been minimized because it keeps getting re-exposed due to the tides and shifting sands, but that is a concern that we need to know. Uh, if you notice any changes or anything else, please feel free to call us. I have a lot of business cards with me. There's also some cards from the Florida Public Archaeology Network in the back that tell you what to do if you ever find any artifacts on on a beach or anywhere else. And you can call them. They're a great public resource, and we definitely trust them to help you guys with anything associated with these wrecks.
I, I'm sorry, you, you said if the... Okay, so he asked me if uh, when the wa when the wood becomes waterlogged, does it be does the water penetrate throughout the entirety of the timbers, or does it simply penetrate to a certain depth? Uh, both are possible. It depends on the age and type of wood. Uh, I've seen very recent shipwrecks where the water has soaked completely through the timbers, and I've also seen very old shipwrecks that are hundreds of years old where the where the wood is soaked all the way through. Oh, sorry, one at a time. I'm going to take him first, and then I'm... Okay. We found uh, unusual plantings that... Uh, On St. George Island? Yeah. With the recent storm, the way that the wind would have been consistent with the possible shift from water. Uh, you know, Dog Island. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he, he mentioned that there was a, a timber or, or plank found on, on St. George Island and with the, after a recent storm and with the current patterns and the wind patterns during that storm. I know that everybody has lots of questions uh, for Ivor. Uh, he's not leaving as soon as it's over, and, and we do have another speaker after him, so it would be good if we could uh, let him continue, and then he'll be around to answer questions from all of you that have your own experiences or things you could share with him that'll be helpful. So if you could try to keep the questions to a minimum at this point, it'd be helpful. Sure thing. Uh, so the information on the talk will be on on YouTube. You, you mentioned a, a Beach TV network, uh, and as well, I'll be providing the PowerPoint directly to the History Museum for distribution after that, if they need to catch up on anything that they've missed or if they're anything like that and on the Facebook page as well. Uh, so finally, after we assess these threats and I am wrapping it up here, I apologize for taking a little bit longer. Um, we have to decide what's next. Uh, now the first step I mentioned is more historical research, identify some more ships that may have been gone, that may have gone down in the area that would have burned and match the criteria that we've identified so far. Uh, further archaeological investigations, looking at things like those square cut nails that you mentioned, um, admit possibly identifying the wood, some more detailed analysis of the fasteners are also very much in the ballpark of what we might do in the future. Uh, we would also like to perform an additional remote sensing survey offshore of the island uh, to discover any other remains that may have become exposed or are exposed underwater uh, that may or may not be associated with these shipwrecks or, or and these timber fragments. Uh, and then you, you asked me earlier what the next step as far as preservation and conservation would be. Uh, conserving a wooden shipwreck is very, 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 very expensive. Uh, generally, what you do is you take the waterlogged wood and we use a compound called polyethylene glycol or PEG for short, um, and it soaks into the wood and slowly replaces the water in the uh, cellular structure, and I do mean slowly. They have recovered entire shipwrecks uh, in the 1960s, and they are still treating them with PEG. Uh, PEG is very expensive, uh, and we can only really justify it for smaller timber fragments. We cannot and we do not have the facilities to conserve an entire shipwreck like this at this time. Uh, beyond that, Without a definite identification, um, we have to, you know, assign our resources as they are. And the best protection that we can offer it for now is to leave it in place and to protect it from looters. That'll preserve as much as we can for now. We will enter talks and potentially post signage with FWC on the island as long as we get permission from any landholders that, that are associated with the property. Uh, but that is definitely the best course of action for now. Um, 
coupled with leaving it in place, that does not mean that we just forget about it. We will, every few years hopefully, uh, come back and reassess the wrecks for any damage or any other things that may have become exposed or anything else that may have happened. And of course, one of our most important resources uh, for BAR, we are only five people, five underwater archaeologists for an entire 18,000 square miles of submerged sovereign of sovereign state waters. Uh, if you do the math real quick, that means we're each responsible for over 3,000 square miles of ocean. Uh, I'm a good swimmer. I can't swim that far or that fast. Uh, so what we would very much appreciate is anybody that goes out to the wrecks, send us pictures, send us updates or changes that you may have identified. We've already gotten a great response on these wrecks so far. I have my business card here. I have more information in the back. If you'd like my contact information, please feel free to reach out. And anytime you go out to the wrecks, even if it's just one or two pictures, that might still tell us how the wrecks are doing and if we need to go out there. So if you guys could reach out to us, call us with any changes on the wrecks. And of course, as I mentioned, to combat the looting, if you guys see anybody on board there, please, as first course of action, just explain to them that these wrecks are state property. If you do take from them, that is an illegal act that can be punishable by prison time and a large fine. Um, and then if they don't stop, yes. Mm -hmm. So that, that's exactly why, so Joe, Joan here mentioned that one nail could be key to identifying the ship, and that's very true. Especially anything that's exposed and easily accessible to us is just as easily access, accessed by looters that want to take parts of the shipwreck away. Uh, and what that means is that they are destroying the archaeological record and might limit our ability to identify the site. But if you do see them, just explain to them it's state property, it's an illegal act, and if they still continue to do it, take down any information that they have, and then contact your local FWC or police officers. Uh, and then finally, to wrap up my talk, I'd just like to go through some quick acknowledgments. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Carabao History Museum for hosting us and putting this entire event together. Uh, it has been very, very fantastic. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Rod Gashi and Mr. Frank Stevenson for uh, cooperating with me and providing me some artifacts that washed up on shore. I see one of them is in attendance here, so I'd like you all to give him a hand, please. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, uh, I'd also like to th thank the Florida Department of State and Florida Division of Historical Resources for coming out uh, and or for, for letting me go out to the wrecks and investigate them. Without their support, this wouldn't have been possible. And then finally, really, I'd just like to thank my colleague, Nick Yarbrough, for letting me drag him through three-foot seas on a very small boat last Wednesday uh, and letting me take a good look at the wrecks. Thank you very much, guys. You guys have been a very fantastic crowd. Well, it might be easy to take some questions and answers right now, you know, since we're in a group. And uh, but if you are loud enough and we can repeat the questions so everybody can hear it. When you say, uh, sorry, you asked me if we take any core samples and we do any tagging. When you say core samples, do you mean sediment cores or timber cores? Mostly timber cores. Right? Okay. So we, we do take uh, sediment cores quite often. Timber cores can be very, very problematic. Um, because of the wood, it's very, uh, it can be hard to find a good core that will penetrate into a, a hard wood like oak or live oak or anything like that. Um, and once we take the cores, that is an identification tool we can use, but it's mostly to identify the age of the, uh, um, of the wood, which can already be identified by looking at some of the cut ends of the timbers we have already. So it's much more of a question of how close we want to get to the uh, age identification. Yes, sir. Now, the structure that the dock or house structure that's there? Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not. It was suspected initially to be a dock. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he asked me what the structure was that the hull section was laying on after it was exposed or was washed up after the hurricane. Uh, initially, we suspected it was a historic dock structure associated with the shipping activities in that area. Uh, we were not able to access it last Wednesday as it was right in the surf zone and getting beat by four-foot waves. However, uh, there is something that looks like a concrete tank or something in the area, which makes me suspect that it's much more of a house structure, especially uh, knowing what I know now. You mentioned that 
the house had been moved, um, so I, fingers crossed, suspect that that might be uh, some of the remains that, that were left behind once it was moved. Oh, sorry. It, it was always on the Gulf side, but as the island moved further towards the bay, it had, the house had to be moved. Is that what I heard right over? And, sir? Okay, so that okay, so that's what we suspected once we saw the concrete tank uh, for ourselves as well. He mentioned that the house there uh, and the concrete tank that we saw was likely the septic tank that was associated with the house, uh, and the owners of the house have mentioned that the house was moved about you said about 200 feet, sir. Yeah, about 200 or 250 feet from its original location. That's probably what we saw there. Unfortunately, when we were there, uh, we weren't able to make contact with the homeowners, but that is something that we're working on. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, he asked me if there's any possibility of forensic evidence. When you say forensic evidence, what is it exactly you mean, sir? Uh, there. Yeah, so he's specifically referencing uh, human remains. Uh, we did not see any. Uh, there is always a possibility of human remains on any archaeological site, especially a shipwreck that is associated with the disastrous loss at sea. However, with the dynamic environment and given that the ship or the structure is likely washed up and has been scoured out many times, it is very unlikely that anything that would have settled into the hull structure uh, or any human remains that would have settled into the hull structure are still present unless they are in one of the larger concretions that we saw. So I suspect not, but there is always a possibility. Uh, I, he asked me what the reason was for the fire. Uh, you're talking about on, bo on board the Fanny? Yeah, um, it just says that it caught fire. Um, I do not know how or why. Uh, typically, on a ship, what happens if it catches fire? It's either a lantern that went wrong or it's something that happened in the cook's galley. That's the two key points that we look at. And tar, pitch, and turpentine are very flammable. So once a fire spreads outside any covered areas in a ship, it spreads very, very fast and very quickly. Uh, but I do not have any definite knowledge of what that is. But that's part of our historical research. If we can find any records on that ship, to take a look and see if that'll help us. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, well, that, so he, he mentioned that um, the, the, the wrecks got exposed in, in October and that we were only out there last week, and that's a, a span of a, a couple or several months um, of time before we were able to get out there. Now, one of the reasons is that. Uh, when a hurricane or a natural disaster strikes, we get a travel advisory and all non-essential travel is halted for a time. Um, with the intensive recovery efforts that have happened, not only in Caribou, but also in the surrounding regions, particularly a little bit further west of here, any non-essential travel was terminated and canceled by the state until a few weeks ago. So that's one of the reasons we weren't allowed to go out earlier than that. Uh, another reason, um, especially when it got a little bit further away from the hurricane, is that we have another other projects and this is the first time I had any time available to go out there and I realize that it's uh, a long length of time but that's one of the reasons that I try and emphasize public interaction from the local population because that's one of our key sources of initial information on a site usually. Did that, does that answer? <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. So, Sorry? There, so there's 10 people living. Uh, so he asked me what the population is of Dog Island. Uh, there's about 10 prop. How many houses? Sorry? Uh, you had 130 houses before the hurricane, and you lost 15 houses. Is that right? Okay. So that gives you nine. And is that permanent inhabitants or seasonal? 
All right, so there are 10 permanent residents on the island itself. Yes, that's exactly what a, what what a yes. That so he mentioned that uh, some of the ballast piles that were found would have been in ballast cribs. So that's a structure that they would have been able to throw their ballast in for easy recovery or use later on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so he, um, you, you mentioned that some of the slag that was found in the ballast uh, was identified as coming from, uh, you said, 16th century European uh, smithies or metalworking shops. Uh, now, that is very possible. There is every possibility that um, ships from that era were in the area and would have dumped some stuff overboard. Um, as far as... Uh, I, I cannot, I do not have the expertise to talk about metallurgical analysis or, or, or that. It is possible, but I can't give you a definite answer to that, sorry. No, I just mean, like, I, I couldn't give you a, a definite explanation. I don't have any docu direct documentation of ships in the area. No, no, so, yeah, so you mentioned that they did a metallurgical analysis. So I, I trust the metallurgical analysis. I don't have a historical explanation right offhand is what I meant. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh. So she, she asked me what I could tell from ballast stones and piles of ballast, um, whether we can identify the type of ship or the origin of the ship from there. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no, because uh, what happens is, uh, you know, ships might, when they initially are constructed, take on ballast from their, let's call it their home country or their origin port, uh, but they're trading different goods and stuff all the time, which means that they change their ballast load all the time as well. Uh, and they change their ballast load. If they take on ballast, they take some of the local ballast of wherever they are. Uh, there's also paying ballast like bricks where they offload that and sell it at the port. Um, and then if they take on ballast, they take it on from that local port as well. So we have, it's, it's, it's much too transient. And we have ballast piles in Pensacola from stones from all over the world. Um, so that doesn't unfortunately tell us a whole lot. We can definitely assume that, yes, that's true. We could assume that some of the stones there uh, are from all over. That is correct. So the, I, I've heard some of, of Potter in, that, uh, in this dynamic environment. It's hard to tell. It could be associated with anything on the ship. If there's prehistoric sites offshore, it could be mixed in with that. Uh, you know, big rock piles catch stuff very easily. I'd have to see it um, to give you any kind of rough idea on that. Yes, they could. Uh, uh, jugs like that, especially the Spanish, used ceramic jugs for a very long time uh, as transportation for any kind of uh, any kind of bulk good. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so she, she mentioned um, that a lot of people here had pictures. If you guys would like to reach out to me, I do have cards here. Uh, if you don't have cards, uh, or if you don't grab one of those cards, the best way to reach me is you could reach out to staff at the Carabell History Museum, if that's all right, and they could contact me. Uh, otherwise, I can give out my state phone number if you guys have a pen and paper handy, or I can give that to you as well. I have more cards right here if they, if they need them. I have several hundred, so hopefully enough for everybody to take one. Uh, but the state phone number that you can reach me at is area code 850, then 245-6435. I'm sorry, go ahead.
Okay, so she she asked. Okay, so she asked me if um, she's been out there a couple of times, and she's just wondering um, if the hull section and the bow structure that we were talking about in the presentation are from the same wreck. Uh, as of right now, I'm going to say no, um, and it's only because the uh, diagnostic measurements that we were able to take from the hull structure um, show or seem to be from a larger size ship than anything that would have been associated with the bow or with the keel or with the bow structure that we saw earlier. Um, so right now, I think there are several uh, of different ships. However, they could be of ships designed for a similar purpose, if that makes sense. So the Fanny would be the the Fanny Holmes would be um, the potentially be or allegedly be the uh, a bow structure that we saw. That's the most likely candidate that I've found so far. That doesn't mean that there's other candidates out there, or not, that, that, that could still mean that there's other candidates out there, and I can't provide a definite answer as of yet. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. This is great. We cannot believe the turnout. And uh, I don't know if Michael Pace is still here. Uh, we have, you've seen some of the lovely stuff that's been put out here in the way of imagery. Uh, Michael Pace runs the Lost Treasures Gallery that's on Marine Street across from the museum. And uh, um, he's just really getting an incredible collection of ancient maps. There's one map that I see has sort of gone flat down there. <laughs> I'll have to stand it up. It's on this big barbecue pit uh, that shows Dog Island uh, being split in two almost from a hurricane of 1852. Um, so that's interesting, you know, just to see how the... The island has changed so much, and I guess it could split in that same point again someday. Um, I don't know if Michael's still here, but um, he's uh, available for questions. And um, you know, and, and his wife Pat's back there. She can at least answer any questions you may have because they're um, expert photo restorationists, and the museums are using his skills to um, doctor up old photos that we've had that were just completely non-recognizable people and now we could see who they are, I mean, see that they are a person. Uh, he is ex very skilled at um, photo restoration if you have an interest in that. And the maps um, are definitely worth seeing. Um, I think at the earliest map he had that showed even Florida on it was some kind of a 1500s map from Portugal. And there's lots of, uh, I wanted them to match uh, the date, I believe, that Ivor said was the first mention of Ile de Chine was like 1733. And I believe he has that map on display at the gallery as well. Anything else we want to tell? If everybody here gave us a quarter, we'd be so happy. <laughs> we have several donation buckets. And uh, we also would love for you to join the Caribou Historic Society. And uh, Stephen, I see you looking like you think there's something needs to be said. Right. You can go climb the lighthouse this afternoon. Looks like it's going to be a nice day. Museum will be open afterwards. And, and Ebor's around to, you know, you can go up and ask him questions. We did get some other pictures that are on that little monitor um, that shows some of the different nails that were spoken of. And uh, I'm sure if you want to keep handing us uh, discs of photos that we can pass on, that we'll have this, these wrecks will be very well documented. But I am really moved uh, to hear that one nail could help to identify it, and I would hate that to be a nail that was looted. Thanks for coming, everybody.